Hello everybody and welcome back to another video on financial analysis and today we are going to be looking at DHL. Now the aim of these videos is to help you to read and interpret financial information and that may be because you are working and DHL is one of your customers, uh, one of your clients perhaps, maybe you are looking to supply to them, maybe you're looking to buy from them, maybe you're looking to use them to sell a parcel and you want to make sure they're not going to go bust while they're in charge of your parcel or maybe you are looking for uh, some additional hints on whether to invest in DHL. So all of uh, this is relevant to you guys, um, uh, and we are going to be helping you to uh, understand their financial statements. So let's look at what DHL do, probably a household name familiar to most of us. Um, uh, it's actually Deutsche Post um, is the name of the company, which I have to admit I didn't know. I'm um, trading as Deutsche Post DHL Group. It's a German multinational package delivery and supply chain management company headquartered in Bonn. So not only are they uh, kind of, you know, taking parcels from A to B, which many of us will be familiar with, but they actually help corporates with their overall supply chain management, which can be very, very complex in today's globalized um, world. And it's one of the world's largest courier companies, which we probably um, are familiar with. So there is uh, uh, what DHL do. We're going to take a look at their financial statements in a minute. And then at the end of that, we're going to look at their share price and uh, have a little think about whether we think they are a good value or not. Everything we give uh, on this uh, video, though, is our, I'm going to be giving my opinion, uh, certainly not my advice, because I'm not qualified to give my advice. So Let's take a look at their financial statements. Here are their financial statements. It's available on their website. Now, uh, you know, I'm recording this very early, January 2023, and the annual report is 2021. So it is very out of date. Uh, and at some point in the next month or so, or few months, um, they will be producing their 2022 figures. So, um, you know, you can use this analysis um, uh, by, you know, listening to what I'm talking about, uh, get the 2022 report in front of you and you can perform the same analysis, pull out uh, the same salient numbers uh, and draw your own conclusions. So um, in their report, uh, here are their key financial numbers. This is sort of the stuff that they're using to, um, uh, to, 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 to the, the metrics, the key financial metrics um, that they're using to measure their performance. Uh, and then we've got all of the contents, who they are, what they do uh, and what their strategy is. Um, if you want to know more about the business, then this is a very good source of that. Obviously, they're going to give you a very positive spin in there. Um, but we in this analysis are much more interested in the finances um, and the financial information. We got to scroll all the way down to page 82 uh, of this report. So uh, page 82 of uh, I think it's 100 and, uh, 162 of the PDF document and we will find the income statement. So here we are, look at the income statement. What do we see on the top line? Top line is the revenue. Here it is. We are dealing in millions of euros. So these guys, their revenue, 82 billion euros, 81,747 million. That's a nearly 82 billion. That is an increase of 22% on the previous year. So a massive increase. Now, don't forget 2020 is obviously COVID. Uh, so we're all shut down and, uh, you know, not so many parcels going out. I'm still running supply chain, so pretty key. Um, but, you know, we're not kind of posting so much around the place. Um, uh, and that's probably why the revenue was lower in 2020 rather than just seeing a massive increase. So we don't kind of, we're not expecting to see um, uh, a kind of, you know, that continued 22% year on year. Now, quite interesting the way these guys present the numbers. They don't talk about cost of sales, which would be the cost of the service, and then gross profit. So they are talking much more about the materials expense and the staff costs. So materials expense, um, note 14 will kind of tell us a little bit more about that. You know, one might assume that that's kind of the packaging, I guess. So here is note 14 um, on the right hand of your uh, uh, page, um, and we can see that it is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, fuel and aircraft fuel is the material cost and the, you know, cost of, you know, transporting costs. So, um, you know, all of those actual costs of transporting, it's not just the actual packaging as well. So um, that's the kind of the materials expense, um, which is appearing in their income statement. 
And that's showing the importance of using uh, the notes. So when we're looking at um, a set of accounts, um, you know, do look at the notes. They provide you with additional information. So the big cost for them is really, well, we look at these numbers here. So the big costs uh, to DHL is really, you know, the cost of the kind of shipping and its people. Um, they're going to have some assets which are being depreciated. That's this number here. And then they've got some other operating expenses as well, giving them an operating profit, also known as EBIT, that's earnings before interest and tax of about 8 billion, 8 billion on 82 billion turnover, you know, you're around about nine to 10% operating margin, uh, a little bit up from the previous year when it was 7%. Um, these guys, in terms of a little bit further down, um, you'll notice uh, they're paying tax, which is good. Um, and they're paying a little bit of finance. Okay, now this is not a big issue for them. They're making 8 billion of profit uh, and they're paying about 746 million euros in interest. But that's going to tell me they've probably got some debt or some leased assets sitting on their balance sheet. So that's just a clue there. Um, uh, and what we've done is this comparison by comparing these two numbers together. This is known as the interest cover. Can they afford uh, whatever debt or leases that they've got? And the answer is yes, they can. So bottom line is a profit of 5.4 uh, billion. 5.4 billion on 84 billion is a 6% bottom line. It's not a massive amount, but it's a reasonably healthy margin, I think. You know, these guys are, you know, they're quite commoditized. I don't really care, you know, who, uh, who carries my parcel from A to B as long as it gets there. But obviously, you know, in terms of supply chain, they'll have relationships with big companies, you know, and part of that relationship will be kind of reliability and responsiveness and, and all the other sort of, you know, um, aspects they bring to um, that, uh, that relationship. So there's their income statement. Let's go and have a look at their balance sheet. So balance sheet is on the next page down. We've got the assets on the left and then the liabilities are all on the right. So let's start off with our assets. Um, the non-current assets are the things we need to run the business. About 41 billion. Most of that is property, plant and equipment. So uh, this will be their kind of distribution centers and, and, and all this kind of stuff. You know, they could rent a warehouse, but they're going to own a lot of, um, you know, vehicles, trains, planes, quite possibly. Often you see DHL airplanes flying through the sky, you know, all of that. And, and, and again, more information on Note 23. Note 22 is their intangible assets. Now, we can have a guess here. I'm guessing that some of that is going to be goodwill, which is a rise on acquisition of other companies so if they've grown by buying other you know companies in the same space uh, in order to kind of you know grow their top line or take out the competition sometimes um, and maybe uh, you know software development I would guess that there's some software you know these guys will have a kind of their own uh, bespoke software solutions uh, that you know customers can track uh, packages etc cetera, etc cetera. and again we'll find out more information about that on note 22. So here is note 22 and we can see um, uh, internally generated intangible assets. So this internally generated intangible assets, this is going to be software. I'm almost convinced by it. Um, these are purchased brand names. So they bought some other you know, names which are well known in the in the distribution. Uh, and, and those are kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the key numbers there. Um, so that's kind of giving us an idea of. Um, those, uh, you know, and, and it may be, you know, these could be licenses, could be patents, could be software, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they've also, interestingly enough, purchased customer lists as well, which they put a value on um, uh, as, uh, as, as well. Um, and um, you can also see the property, plant and equipment. Here it is. Um, so we've got some land and buildings, technical machinery and equipment. There's be sorting offices, for example. IT systems and operating and office equipment um, uh, obviously will be another big one for them. And these guys, and they do have some aircraft, uh, you know, as we expected. So often you'll see an aircraft, which is a DHL aircraft, is just full of boxes. You know, there's obviously there's no passengers um, uh, on there. So those are the big, um, the, you know, the big operating assets that they need to run the business, making up the substantial amount of this 41 billion. The current assets is what they have and they need um, uh, the, the either cash OK, and there's their cash, about three point five billion or expected to become cash. So they've got a little bit of inventory, not a huge amount. That'll be kind of packing tape and boxes. Um, uh, but generally speaking, the big number is this trade receivables who are their customers uh, that they've shipped for and they haven't yet been paid. Obviously not 
um, us retail, we pay and then they ship. Uh, but if you are a corporate customer, they ship and then you pay. So 11.6 billion and they're trying to collect that in. So total assets, 63.6 or 60, uh, nearly 64 billion dollars, uh, euros, sorry. Um, here is the equity side of the business. I'll just scroll that a little bit so we can see the whole picture here. Um, uh, so the liabilities, current liabilities, things that we owe and have to pay soon. Um, so the biggest number here, trade payables, as we'd expect, this is their customers that they have bought things from and haven't yet paid. Um, uh, and we always like to just double check uh, the current assets against those current liabilities. Uh, and it looks like their liquidity is not a problem. So they have received, you know, they've got 20 2.7 billion either as cash or coming in as cash soon uh, and they owe 21 billion that they, they've got to pay soon so liquidity does not appear to be an issue for these guys and then they've also got some non-current liabilities um, and these non-current liabilities you'll notice they call it non-current financial liabilities which is another way of saying debt so those financial liabilities is is debt uh, and the total debt is this 16 billion and this 3 billion that they've got, which is a current. So a little bit thinking about like your mortgage, for example, if you've got a mortgage, you've got to make some capital repayments over the next year, but most of that mortgage, you've got to repay next year and the year after that and the year after that. That's exactly the same as these guys. They've got to pay 3 billion uh, within the next year and the other 16 billion, um, you know, a little bit later down the line. And, you know, what they'll realistically do is go to the bank, go to the, um, uh, go to the market and refinance that debt. So they won't even necessarily try and um, repay it. And the reason they can afford to refinance it is that the interest is relatively low. They're very profitable and they can afford it. So it's not a problem. So it's not going to be keeping them awake at night. So that's the biggest liability there. A um, little bit of provisions, um, a big, that's the biggest long-term liability. Um, and obviously their trade payables, their, their, um, their suppliers is their biggest current liability. And again, uh, nothing looking too you know, you know, excessive there. And if we deduct, if we take all of the assets, uh, which is this 63 billion over here, 64 billion, and we deduct all of the liabilities, which is these two numbers here together, um, uh, the difference between these uh, three numbers is the equity, which is this number here, which is what they owe to the shareholders. So theoretically, if you close the business down, you give about 14, uh, sorry, 19 and a half billion dollars back to the shareholders. Now, that's a very theoretical amount. And of course, DHL, they're not closing them down. They're a going concern. So not not an issue there. Uh, and this is made up of the investment in the business and also uh, this retained earnings. So big, big, big retained earnings. These guys have been very profitable. They've been keeping those profits in the business and using those profits in order to expand the business and grow it. Um, have they been paying any dividends? Well, we can check uh, with the movement in equity. So let's just have a quick look at the movement in equity. That's the cash flow statement. Um, here we go. Here's the movement in equity. Um, so retained earnings. We're looking at this column here. Um, uh, and uh, for this year, um, uh, here we go. So this is the retained earnings at the beginning of the year. Um, uh, here is the, the profit for the period. Um, and then you'll notice here, what are they doing? They are paying out dividends. So yes, they are. They're paying. So they're making a profit of about um, uh, five, just over five billion. Um, and uh, they are paying out about 1.7 billion as dividends. And the rest is being reinvested back into the business in order to fund uh, future growth. OK, so that's got to be good. Um, uh, that's got to be good for us if we are, um, you know, if we are investing or looking to invest in these guys. So there's our, our balance sheet. Um, let's go on to the cash flow statement. Got to zoom out for to see the numbers of the cash flow statement. So apologies if you're watching this on a small screen and you're struggling to see the numbers. Um, let me pull out some of the key numbers. So here we see this is the, the cash that they are generating. These guys are generating cash, 10 billion of cash uh, from uh, operating activity. So very, very strong there in terms of the cash flow. Um, they are investing. Uh, look at the investment here, about 5 billion um, a net, uh, which is effectively buying 
property plant and equipment um, and you can see that's the biggest number there there's the investment in the property plant and equipment um, uh, etc etc so kind of replacing uh, uh, existing property plant and equipment just double check that there's the depreciation so if you're depreciating your existing equipment at about 3.8 billion and you're spending about 3.8 3.7 billion on new equipment those two are roughly aligned and that gives me a feeling that you know they are replacing equipment as it needs replacing not necessarily growing um but certainly you know the the old sorting machine that doesn't work anymore sling it out buy a new one so it looks to me uh, and i'm sure there's a few people from dhl who go no 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 i'm i'm still using the the sorting machine that was purchased back in the 1940s but you know as a general kind of worldwide view these guys look like they're replacing the assets and investing in new technology and they kind of have to because they've got to keep up with that that um, uh, that process um, the last bit of the cash flow statement, just dropping onto the next page, is the financing activities. So that's what's going on here. Um, uh, they're giving you a net movement in uh, the um, sort of uh, uh, financial liabilities, uh, which is going on here. Um, uh, and uh, they're also paying out. There's the dividend that we talked about. So here's the pay, pay, uh, the. Uh, the, the payment of the dividend um, uh, going up. So these guys, you know, they're refinancing their business. Um, you know, that's what's going on here. Last year, very much refinancing. Um, here, there was just a, you know, a repayment. So they, you know, they've made extra cash um, and they're just going, look, you know, we can just, we can just reduce our debt a little bit, reduce the, um, uh, the interest that we have to pay. Um, uh, and we can also pay a dividend. Um, and then the rest is being reinvested. Also interesting, just another big number or biggish number, billion um, dollar, a billion euros of treasury shares. So that is shares in DHL. So they are buying back their own shares. It's another way of returning money uh, to the shareholders and is obviously trying to create capital growth rather than income. Um, uh, and they still finish, you know, they still got three and a half billion uh, of, of cash uh, sitting on the balance sheet at the end of the end of the year so these guys you know liquidity is not a problem profitability is not a problem they've got enough cash they can afford their debt they you know they do have quite a lot of debt um uh, they are about uh, i reckon uh, my analysis is they're about uh, uh 50 percent debt funded 50 50 debt and equity um but their effective rate of interest is about four percent um so it doesn't look you know like a like it's such a major problem don't forget debt is tax deductible as well um, which is good um they have got you know pretty strong uh, return on capital employed um uh, i'm just reading off my figures here so my analysis so you know return on capital employed up at about 28 percent um, on an ebitda basis so you know they're profitable um strong returns on that investment um you know they're ticking lots of boxes liquidity is not an issue um you know very nice business where you know their inventory days is 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 nothing that you know they're getting paid at the same time they're paying their supplies so they're pretty much cash neutral in terms of their uh, their working capital um uh, and they've got some you know some you know you know the dividend cover is easy three times uh, covered on their dividend uh, and even if you include um the share buybacks as well so it's all looking pretty good from that perspective um in terms of the share price, um, uh, I promised you to say we would look at the share price. So let's have a quick look at that. Um, uh, and here is their share price. So these guys, you can see the market cap is about 50, just shy of 50 billion. Um, so 50 billion euros, uh, giving them a P.E. ratio of 9.2. Um, so using my earnings, uh, 9.35. Yep, so that's uh, nine times earnings. Uh, remember, the earnings are about 50 billion. Um, so yeah, so nine to 10 times earnings, uh, just over 50, uh, sorry, 5 billion. So the net profit is about 5 billion, which, you know, if you turn that the other way uh, upside down, you get a yield of about 10.7%. And 10.7% is not unreasonable. Now, I know we, we're living in a higher inflationary environment, but if you're getting an investment with a return of 10%, uh, to 11 percent i reckon that's reasonably hedged against inflation now i don't know the industry well enough as to whether they're going to be able to push the prices up but one would expect that you know they're not operating on massive margins one would expect that you know all supply chain management companies you know as costs go up they've just got to feed them through to their to their customers so it'll be it'll be competitive but these guys don't look like they're going to be operating at a loss 
share price has been bouncing around a little bit. Um, I don't know whether it's kind of cheap uh, by historical standards or not. We're looking at the five year. Um, so you can see it kind of you know, tipped all the way up and then it's all the way back down again. Um, and now it's kind of on the way back up again. Um, but it's looking, you know, that there's, you know, there is goodwill. You know, if you pay 50 billion, um, the balance sheet, the net book value is about 20 billion. That's the equity sitting in the balance sheet. Um, uh, and so the difference between those two uh, is about 30 billion, um, which is kind of the inherent goodwill, I guess. Um, and you've got a dividend um, a yield there of 4.4%. Again, not bad. Um, you know, you're going to be losing money. Um, but if you can get a, you know, if you can get an overall yield, yield a P ratio of 10%, you're going to get a 10% return on your investment, um, then, uh, you know, of that, you're going to get 4.4% is going to be um, your income and the rest will be your uh, capital gain. So not not looking too bad. So it's not crazy cheap, certainly isn't crazy expensive, um, uh, and looks pretty reasonable um, to me. Um, so there is DHL. Um, one last thing just to kind of point out, um, which uh, we've been doing in these videos, which uh, may be of interest to some of you. Um, if we look on page 107 uh, of their report, here is page 107. Um, you get information about the staff costs. So you can see here that they're spending about 23, 24 uh, million uh, euros, sorry, billion, 24 billion euros. Uh, and that is the cost of their staff now i've used kind of the average for the year so average what they call full-time equivalents don't forget these guys are going to employ lots of people or you know part-time uh, and kind of you know reduced hours etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you kind of take an average of all the full-time equivalents of 528,000 people working there uh, and you pay them about 23.8 23.9 nearly 24 billion euros you know, the average salary is about 45,000 euros. Now that, that, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. That sounds, a, that sounds like qu quite a high amount. So, uh, you know, if I was working here, I'd be thinking, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty, well, I, I maybe look at this and thinking, well, hold on a second, I'm way below average, um, in which case, you know, well, that's not, you know, maybe you're going to have a conversation with your boss, but, you know, an average salary of 45,000 euros, um, I think is certainly above the average um, for, certainly for the UK, which is about 33,000 um, uh, pounds. Um, the CEO, though, if you want to know how much uh, the big boss uh, earns, um, you're not going to find it in this document, interestingly enough. You have to dig around a little bit. It's a separate document, but there is a 2021 remuneration report. If you uh, can find it, here it is. Um, so let's just whiz down uh, through this and we will find uh, on the remuneration report um, details of uh, the CEO's salary. So let me just see if I can pull that up for you. So here is Frank Apple. Um, he is the CEO. There he is. Um, lots of information. And quite frankly, it's quite difficult. It's quite easy. But, you know, what I tend to do is just go, look, come on, let's just let's just go and find the kind of, you know, the big number. So there's the big number. It says max 2021. There's a min 2021. If he doesn't hit his targets, um, you know, has he hit them? I don't know if he's hit them. But, you know, if he's going to get about 11 million euros as a remuneration um then he's on 239 times the average salary of his um uh, of his employees um is he worth it well hey you can make that decision i mean dhl is a pretty complicated beast um and i'm sure he works very hard um uh, for that um uh, that remuneration so there you have it. There is DHL. There is the financial statements of DHL 2021. I hope you found that useful. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel. If you found it useful, uh, please do share it with your friends. And I look forward to seeing you all on the next video of the financial analysis. Catch you later. So I hope you enjoyed that video and found it useful and informative. Now, if you want to know more about uh, what I do, then you can visit Talk Financials and find out about the training workshops uh, and the clients uh, that I work with. And the QR code uh, is on your screen right now. If you are interested in being able to do this yourself, to do some uh, financial analysis, there's a couple of resources. There is an online workshop. Uh, it's available on my website or you can 
click on the QR code and it'll stay, take you straight through uh, to this online workshop uh, where you can learn to read and understand and interpret financial information yourself. Alternatively, there is a book available at all good bookstops, particularly a very big online one and the QR code once again will take you through to the opportunity to buy the book uh, and there is also a Kindle edition. Um, otherwise that's everything from me please 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 don't forget to like share and subscribe uh, to the channel more subscribers uh, uh, makes it uh, uh, means that you're going to get um, notification um, about uh, new videos coming up uh, and also the opportunity to you know ask questions and do recommend any videos uh, or sorry any companies that you'd like me uh, to analyze for you um, I think we've got a couple of uh, suggested next videos coming up uh, so please do uh, take the opportunity have a look at the other videos uh, and don't forget to like share and subscribe to the channel and I will see you on the next video